Hi, my name is John Cornicello, and I welcome you to my series of interactive photo conversations. You can check the schedule at cornicello.com slash conversations for dates and times of upcoming shows. Today, my guest is Don Kamarachka. Uh, Don uses photography as a way to explore and understand the world around him. His work pushes up against the technical and uh, the technical limits of modern camera equipment and the physical limitations of light itself. His goal is a weaving of art and science to yield fascinating results. So please welcome Don Kamarachka. Why, thank you, John. I uh, appreciate the introduction. And, you know, uh, when I first started with photography, uh, I, I kind of found it in a way that I think everybody does. You, you do a bit of everything and you see what you like, what you don't like, and you slowly, slowly gravitate towards areas of, uh, of interest. And uh, for me, I realized early on, uh, wedding photography was not my thing. Uh, and I think everybody can agree that landscape photography in some way is appealing. Uh, and, and so it is for me. But in that general sense, I just felt like I was taking photos that other people had already taken. And I was walking in other people's footsteps. And uh, when it came to macro photography, when it came to exploring um, what I call the universe at my feet, that was dramatic uh, because I was in my own little world. Anything that I captured was unique to me. And anybody in the exact same scenario um, would, uh, would kind of feel the same for themselves. Right? There was very little overlap, even with identical subjects um, and the same equipment. So that's uh, kind of the, the impetus to uh, what we're going to be talking about today here. Uh, sort of the, uh, the the universe at our feet at large here, and I I call it that partly because you know there's so much to explore. I I love I, I love exploring uh, the universe at, at large. You know, going out uh, on a cloudless night and seeing the beautiful stars overhead. Maybe catching a uh, uh, a meteorite um, or a, a shooting star rather and seeing how that all kind of plays into this landscape and cameras rolling, three of them to take this image, but I'm just sitting there and I'm enjoying. That's beautiful. And it's humbling to know that somebody else might be seeing something similar. But there's only so many times I can do that before it feels like, well, that's the same Milky Way. It hasn't really changed much since the last time I saw it. Uh, and maybe the foreground has changed. Maybe I've put myself in a different location and I've gone through a trek and, uh, and there's an adventure to get there. But by the time I make the image, I'm just putting a different foreground in front of the same subject. And I, I'm not saying that's a bad thing. I'm going to do it again. But I'm just saying that it, it feels that there's a certain level of sameness to it that I don't get when I photograph things like a snowflake. And I can use exactly the same technique time and time again. And I'm constantly getting different results. And oh, I mean, that's just the nature of the subject of a, of a snowflake. And they're all unique and, and beautiful in so many ways. And so we're going to start here because I'm finishing up my snowflake series uh, for the year as we talk about documentary macro photography. Um, but it's going to get more inventive and artistic as we go through. Sometimes, though, you just see a gem like this, and it makes you scratch your head. It's like, well, what, what the heck is that? Why do I have a very colorful spring flower type shape in the center of a snowflake? Um, well, I mean, there's physics involved, thin film interference, uh, which is the same physics that puts rainbows in soap film uh, and uh, oil spots and such. Um, and you can find it in snowflakes and they're just enigmatic and there's so many different sizes and varieties. This image has uh, one big and at least three small snowflakes uh, in, in the image. And sometimes it's dramatic. It's amazing what you can capture. All of these, by the way, two feet from my back door. Now, two feet from my back door, um, that, uh, that yeah, sometimes it's just no snow at all. Sometimes uh, it's the perfect storm. Uh, it, it's all relative. But how do you capture these? And um, it's pretty simple. It's a black mitten. Uh, just uh, simple black. That's the backdrop for all of my snowflake images. It doesn't need to be more complicated than that except that it does uh, in the sense that, yes, I've got a camera that has a fairly high powered magnification lens on it. Um, but again, that's also it. There's no complicated contraption. Uh, there's just me hand holding the camera as the snow is actively falling on that mitten. Now, if you were, um, say, if you've done any bird photography and you've got a super telephoto lens and uh, you know, you've got a cloudless blue sky and a bird that's darting around in the sky and you hold up your lens and you try to find the bird in the frame, you won't. I mean, because you have no frame of reference to where it is versus where you saw it. And it's, uh, it's going to be a really tricky thing to find. 
Um, same thing for snowflakes. So what I'll typically do is I'll hunt around for a good one, but they can be very, very small. So I will take a tiny little paintbrush and I'll use it to either uh, on one side, clear off some clutter uh, from the snowflake. And, uh, and then when I have the, the one that I want, I'll lay the brush down on the mitten pointing to the snowflake. Uh, I don't have to find the snowflake. I have to find the brush. It's a much bigger target to spot. Uh, and at that point I can guide myself in and yeah, yeah. If this looks like an intimidating set of camera equipment, um, it's just high magnification. And there's a lot of ways for you to get there that don't have to be very expensive. And now I have a lot of macro lenses. This is not a complete uh, uh, image. I've added a few since then. I've shot with microscope objectives. I've shot with new lenses, antique lenses, high magnification, and the weird Liowa 24 millimeter probe lens, and uh, every bit of equipment. Yeah, that's uh, the one that, up front there, right? That, that's the, yeah, it looks like a rifle barrel. Um, <laughs> it took me a long time to find an actual use for that lens, John. Um, I've, I've more used it for documentary film work, for video stuff, than I have for, for still photography. Uh, so I got it with um, uh, a cinema modification for follow focus uh, for, for that purpose. But looks like um, a proctoscope. Yeah, <laughs> yeah just about. <laughs> Haven't used it for that purpose though, Michael. Uh, but in, uh, in this case, you know, looking at the, this array of equipment, you've got the Canon MPE 65 millimeter lens in the middle. That's the one that I was using for snowflakes. And it's a classic workhorse that goes to five times the regular macro magnification, but, but it's not the only one. Um, you've got the uh, a Metacon uh, 20 millimeter lens. John, I think you've got this one here. I the do. Super macro uh, 4.5 times. And it's only, I, I don't know, two or $300. I forget what they're selling it for now, but it's, uh, it's fairly affordable. Mm -hmm. um, you've got the Liowa 2.5 to five times macro lens. You've got the uh, Metacon 85 millimeter uh, one to five times. You can even dial it back a couple of centuries or a couple of decades rather uh, and go to the uh, 1970s where you've got the Canon Bellows macro lenses. Olympus made some uh, in the same design. The reason why I'm showing you all of this is because the specific gear that I'm using doesn't matter and it doesn't have to be new stuff either. That workhorse Canon MPE 65 millimeter lens, it came out in 1999. It's over two decades old and it's still a current lens in the Canon lineup. And the reason for that is because it doesn't need autofocus. In fact, it doesn't need focus at all. Uh, macro photography uh, doesn't benefit from the latest advances in image stabilizers either. You know, the, the, the things that we covet in a modern, fast, sharp lens, they're immaterial to a lot of this stuff because we have other challenges that we need to face along the way. So old stuff can often be good stuff. And that kind of lowers the bar of entry um, into this kind of realm of photography. But with snowflakes, as with a lot of different subjects that I, uh, uh, that, that I, that I do battle with, um, your depth of field is incredibly shallow. <laughs> so when I'm photographing a snowflake, this is typically what I would get in focus in, in a singular frame. Uh, and I'd have to focus uh, or shift my focus, my focal plane across the entire subject. The average snowflake might take around 40 or so separate images to create it completely in focus from tip to tip. Um, and that's an arduous task. It's tedious. Uh, you know, this is one of the biggest that I've ever worked on. And I published this one earlier this year. I required 86 separate frames to get it completely in focus from this tiny little sliver of focus that you see here to be this massive snowflake um, that is, uh, I mean, it's documentary. And I love doing the documentary work. Don't get me wrong. In fact, um, if I, uh, I'm going to switch uh, my display here. This is a snowflake um, that uh, that I'm working on. I'm finishing up my snowflake series for the year, uh, and this is the penultimate one. Be Good one timing, after. as I hear it's getting pretty warm by you. It's <laughs> getting real warm. Uh, thankfully, I've got a whole bunch that I've shot that I haven't edited yet. Um, but this is this is sort of like a halfway through the edit after Photoshop's automatic stuff. If you were to look in super close on something like this. Um, you'll find issues. Uh, you might have to know where to look to find them, um, but I certainly do. And you can see like there's certain pixels that are offset by, uh, you know, by a number. And I've got to go in and manually find whatever layer that happens to be, uh, which I'm just clicking on one at random. So I'm not sure what that's going to end up showcasing me. But you can see that I would go into a layer like this 
and I would try to paint in individual fixes uh, to correct for any offsets or, uh, or issues. It's not a difficult process. It's, it's muscle memory after a while. It, it's like knitting a sweater. Um, you, you just, you kind of go through the motions, uh, and, and you'd make that all happen. But, uh, to me, uh, that is, that's part of my winter. And it is at this point, you can see the mitten fibers that, uh, that exist in the image. Those get edited out, um, uh, when, when the final image is, is produced, but this is a very repetitious process. It's very iterative. Uh, every time I do it again, it's a different subject but I, I repeat and it's almost identical from one to the next. Um, but when it comes to uh, other subjects, you know, I, I can go out right now. We've got crocuses and snowdrops that are blooming and we've got the bees that are coming out. Maybe not the leaf cutter bees yet. These guys are adorable critters. They, um, they stick their butt in the air when they get into a flower because they don't have little pollen sacks on their legs. They have a pollen brush on their abdomen. So they stick their butt in the air, they kick their back legs up to kick pollen uh, onto their backside, and then they go to the next flower and they do the same thing. Adorable. Um, and thankfully, as a macro photographer, knowing my depth of field is very shallow, um, it allows me to get most of it in focus in that, that very shallow depth of field because the backside actually comes back into the plane of focus. Um, so from a technical perspective, that's a, that's a winner of a subject, but it is still just documentary. Right. If I were to take my hand as an artist into this play, uh, it becomes a little bit different where uh, this is well, I didn't make the spider web. I can't take credit for that, um, but I did spray it with water. Uh, this was just a plain old spider web. Nothing fancy about it. It was near a waterfall. And uh, and so that waterfall was the reason why I went out. You know, landscape photography can be fun. And I love uh, slowing down uh, my shutter speed to get a nice serene uh, pattern in water. But here, I discovered the spider web. Waterfalls didn't matter anymore. This was my focus for like an hour. Uh, and, uh, you know, it, it can be what it is. I can't really modify it much more than spraying it with water. But it sparked something in me. It sparked an idea of being able to be the artist as much as I am the documentarian, right? And, and sometimes even more so on the artist side, like you, you never find this in nature. You would never find a freezing soap bubble just on a nature walk. You'd never come across and see the beautiful sunset coming through this random freezing bubble and take the image and say, oh, isn't nature beautiful? No. Um, this is completely constructed by me for the purposes of making an image. And it's not just, you know, uh, mixing up the bubble mixture and carefully blowing the bubble on the snow. It's also lighting it and understanding that the lighting in behind for a shot like this is just, it's basically two flashlights. One of them with an orange color on it coming in from behind, that's back illuminated. Um, but if it was just that one color, then it would feel like I just made a white balance error on the image uh, to make it warm. So then I added a second light that is just hitting the snow uh, with a blue color filter on it in order to create some uh, color separation, some balance uh, across the color palette in this image. And so from my perspective, yes, you have to understand the camera technology, you have to understand the environmental variables, um, you have to understand lighting, but you also have to understand what makes something beautiful and really take that artistry uh, bull by the horns and, mm. and uh, embrace the fact that your photography is not just um, the, the sake of documenting the world around you. I mean, if photography was purely documentary, you better be one of three things. You better be an insurance photographer, you better be an x-ray technician, or, uh, I don't know, crime scene investigator. So in those areas, those are purely documentary. You should not introduce any art into, into those concepts. But beyond that, um, it sneaks its way in, even if you don't want to embrace it. But I, I most certainly do embrace it. Uh, an image like this depicts it quite well, where we have a, a green immigrant leaf weevil. Uh, they are pests in our garden, but I love them so because they are bumbly, cute little bugs that... You know, he's got wings. He, he can fly away. He's just choosing to sit here on this flower where I placed him. Uh, and the pink liquid that it's in is it's actually just water. You're seeing a reflection off the surface of it. Um, and that is a flower that's placed in the background that's providing that color. 
This might look like a highly orchestrated, complicated setup that you might not be able to achieve yourself. But uh, it is, at its core, something that you can easily do on your kitchen table with a very minimal amount of gear. You know, this is uh, that free-floating flower. So I'm, I'm shooting handheld to, to make this image because that flower might move around and I might nudge it back in, into center and spin it around with a little toothpick. Um, but it's free-floating and I'm just shooting at the edge of the water. It's filled to the brim with water in this, uh, in this little dish. And it's just a bare off-camera flash. Not even a fancy trigger. It's just a dumb one that only fires the flash. There's no ETTL metering or anything about that. It just, it's either on or off. Uh, and uh, then the flower in the background with, by the way, these, uh, these little tools, they've got alligator clips on a little swivel base. They're called third hand tools or helping hand tools. Uh, easily found on Amazon. If you just type in third hand tool or helping hand tool, um, you'll get them for under 10 bucks. You know, buy and buy the dozen. Uh, they are so useful for positioning these types of things. I've often used two or three of them uh, in, in a set. I used but to get that, those at Radio Shack about 20, 30 years ago. <laughs> and, and John, you can still get them at some uh, hobby craft stores. They're designed yeah. for like soldering electronics. Yep, uh, that's what I used them for in together, the past. Uh, or fine jewelry work. They'll sell them for that too. The thing is, if they sold them for, uh, for photography, they'd be like 60 or $70 in the camera store. Uh, that's just the way the markup goes for us. So thankfully it's not been embraced by the camera store market yet. You don't have any of these targeted towards photographers. They work just fine as they are. And, and that makes this as an image. Um, but this, this is such a very narrow and modified view of the world, right? This is not the world that we see it. And that brought me to a statement that I, uh, kind of went to early on in, in my career, the fact that we see the world the way that it's useful to us as human beings surviving in this world, but that's not the way the world is. You know, there's lots of things that are inconsequential to our daily lives that could make very interesting photographs that we are completely ignorant of. Um, you know, the person sitting next to you might see the world differently than you do. Your dog certainly does as well. And, uh, and that bee in the flower has an entirely different perception of the universe than we do. Um, so reality then is subjective. And that means that you have the ability to present a version of reality that may or may not be what you consider normal because macro photography is abnormal. We don't see the world at this scale. And so how do you embrace that? Well, here's an idea. Uh, in May of last year, we had a freak snowstorm because, well, uh, 2020 was throwing everything at us. Uh, and so we had this grape hyacinth that was covered in snow. It's a pretty hardy flower. It would survive it. Uh, but it was actively still snowing. And so thereby it's overcast. And uh, I took this image and I thought, you know, I, I can do better. You know, I can, I can take this, this documentary shot and I can modify it. I can add lighting. I can change the background. One uh, key element of macro photography is the background is such a controllable element that might take you a few years of shooting before you fully embrace that idea. So here's, here's a behind the scenes setup of this. Um, you've got a flashlight. Uh, it's just on a tabletop tripod that's just kind of shoved into the snow. Uh, and that's good enough for me. And in the background is a garbage can. Yep, a garbage can uh, that makes the shot. Now, when you take a look at the next shot, it's still not the final image, but it does have a marked improvement over the previous one. Uh, the lighting from the flashlight is separating the foreground from the middle ground a little bit. It's giving some texture and some depth to the subject, even though it's just a bare flashlight. The background has become darker along this pseudo horizon line, just because there's a garbage can back there. Uh, and if I were to adjust my angle after I take this image and think, okay, well, you know, it's an iterative process. I take an image, how can I, you know, improve on it? How can I change it in some way? Well, if I get a little bit lower so that that pseudo horizon line is, um, is completely below the flower, then the, the flower stands out much stronger above, uh, above that overall scene, right? And so that, that to me is that mix of, okay, I discovered this flower in this snow. Um, how do I then tell its story? 
right? And I think this tells that story quite nicely, the complementary color of the background, the additional lighting. And yes, that means I have to take control of the scene. It's not just walking up to something and saying, snap, I'm an artist. Uh, and, uh, and so we, we take that control and we evolve that into images uh, that look sort of like this. Um, John, do you have any questions or commentary? I'm not sure if, if nothing's are come in yet. Questions. So I mean, if anyone in the audience have questions so far, I mean, I'm just enjoying this because I used to have one of those Canon auto bellows and I sold it too many years ago and wish I still had it. You can get it again, John. I think <laughs> I <know. laughs> my, my set cost me like, somewhere in the double digits of dollars. I don't think Michael Newler has his hands up. Bucks. Uh, question, Michael. I have a couple of questions. Sure. Um, where are you located right now? I mean, I'm you... in Barrie, Ontario. It's about an hour north of Toronto. Oh, okay. And, and, um, do you ever take any of your lenses and reverse them using the rear element? Yeah, so uh, you, you can easily take, say roughly a 50 millimeter focal length. If you take a 50 millimeter prime lens, if you've got a nifty 50 in your camera bag and you put it on the camera backwards, you might say, well, Don, how do I do that? Well, you can just hold it there uh, if you're uh, so inclined, but you can buy an adapter that on one side is just, mach it's machined aluminum. So on one side is uh, just the, uh, the lens mount and on the other side is a filter thread. So uh, if you have a 52, 58 millimeter um, filter thread lens, you buy the you know, Canon lens mount to the 58 millimeter thread and you just are able to screw it in backwards. Um, and so that works, uh, uh, Michael, but uh, especially with modern lenses, you don't have aperture control. On a Nikon camera, they snap shut. On a Canon camera, they stay open. Uh, and there's ways around it on the Nikon camera. There's a little flange on the back that you can wedge a piece of cardboard against to keep it open to a particular point. Uh, on the Canon side, it's even trickier because with the lens mounted normally, a lot of cameras will have a depth of field preview button near the base of the lens, uh, which when pressed, it will snap the aperture blades into their uh, current setting so that you can judge your depth of field. With that button depressed, simultaneously dismount the lens and the aperture blades will stay at that setting, then you can reverse the lens and put it on with the aperture at that particular setting. It's not easy. Uh, so I don't recommend you start there because macro photography has enough frustrations when you're doing it with a dedicated proper lens or with other accoutrements such as um, like close-up filters. I've got one sitting on my desk here. Uh, this is from ProMaster. Um, it is a, uh, an achromatic optic, if I position it there. You can see my eye. Look at that. That's, uh, <laughs> that is a, uh, a magnification lens right there. Uh, and that can just You're sharing the, the screen so not everyone could see that, I think. Oh, OK. I'll, I'll, I'll stop the screen so that <laughs> you can see that I'm holding this lens up. And you can see my eye quite readily right in there. But this is just, this is just a, a, an optic that would just- Is that a dual element? Uh, I believe it is a dual element. Oh, it's similar optic. to the Canon close-ups. Similar to the Canon 500D. It is a 5D from ProMaster. Uh -huh. ProMaster close-up lens. Yeah. Uh, pretty affordable for these. And they, they, they have them in different sizes. So if you want to throw that onto an existing lens and get into the macro space, then you know that, that's a great option for yeah, it. Yeah, I guess uh, or the older Canon FD lenses would be easier to stop down than the, than the EF yeah. lenses because you don't have the electronic contact to do it any old manual lens that's purely mechanical would be a much easier adaptation. So I think, that actually I think, it makes a good point, John. Uh, if you have that old Canon AE-1 collecting dust in a closet somewhere uh, and you're wondering when you'll ever shoot another roll of film through it, <laughs> maybe you won't, but you can take that lens and put it backwards on your modern camera and voila, you're in macro space. Well, there are a couple of issues with that. Uh, one, the... the um... The, the, the mount is different on the, on the modern lenses, especially on the Canon. Um, but the other thing is, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, that if you set the aperture of an, um, an EF lens uh, to say, let's say F8, all right, uh, with, the, with, the, with the camera turned on, when you shut the camera off and take the lens off, it will stay at f8. I'm, I'm, I'm not certain it's been too many years, but I, uh, I believe that, that that does work. 
it, it depends on the camera and the manufacturer. There's lots of different Canon, mechanisms Canon. to do. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, but, but even Canon had this weird system in between bridging the FD and the EF mounts. And of course the new RF mount is different even still. Well, um, I'm talking about the, e but, the EF lenses themselves. Uh, no, the, the, the EF lens resting position is wide open. Uh, so the mm -hmm. only way to get it to stay at a stop down level is to press the depth of field preview button while dismounting the lens. Um, but your point also about the older FD mount lenses using a different mount is sort of immaterial because you're not using the mount of the lens when you're putting it on backwards. You're using its filter thread on the front side. Uh, and so you would just need your Canon EF mount on one side to a 52 millimeter filter thread on the other, and then you can screw your lens in using the filter thread to reverse mount it. Again, but it's not, not all ideal. those lenses, but not all those lenses are the same are the same size. Right. So you, you need a bunch. Yeah. 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 So it's easier or, to just get a macro lens. <laughs> or what, what, or you can get, also you know, you get if your smallest filter thread is 52 millimeters, then that's what you use. And then you can use step up or step down adapters uh, yeah. to uh, adapt. Yeah. And, but then you're getting into this whole realm of macro lenses can cost you $100 or so. Are you really putting this amount of effort into reverse mounting a lens for significant gain other than some quirky experiments at that point? Uh, because it's becoming much more affordable to explore it uh, compared to what it used to have been anyhow. Yeah, I want to jump to Daniel's question here about the best way to minimize distortion while macro photo stacking is to keep the subject and camera stationary while moving the lens. Is this correct? Is there a significant difference? Yeah. So uh, there's a number of different ways to focus stack, one of which is a lot of cameras now have in camera, they call it focus bracketing, where it will change the focus of the lens slightly in order to shift the focus through the scene. But even on a dedicated macro lens or even a prime lens, uh, most people don't realize that uh, when you change the focus of a lens, you are also slightly changing change the, the size. Length. Yeah. Yeah. And so the changing the focal length creates something that uh, is, is termed focus breathing. Uh, and very good cinema lenses don't have it, but the majority of lenses do to some degree. And that means that when you put the images together in focus stacking uh, at different fields of view, they will end up being aligned together, stacking inside of each other like those Russian Matryoshka stacking dolls. And then you have to crop into the smallest one of, uh, of the set and use that as a viable image. It's not ideal, it's not a deal breaker, but it's, it's better if you move the camera physically forward and backward I do a lot of this work handheld. You can use a focusing rail on a tripod. They're becoming more and more commonplace and affordable. Um, but uh, the majority of my work is all handheld. Moving the camera forward and backward and oftentimes taking uh, ugh, uh, significantly more images than I otherwise would have needed. Uh, you know, For the average snowflake, if I need 40 photos to stack together, I might take between two and 300 images. Uh, and throw away the ones that I don't need. Uh, but even if I'm after just a single photograph, uh, like that, um, uh, that grape hyacinth that I was uh, showing you there, that is a single frame out of camera that uh, is just the focus exactly where it should be. I didn't take just the one image. My camera was moving ever so slightly forward and backward while I just held my finger on the shutter button and burst and just shot a whole bunch until I filled my camera buffer. Um, in the film era, I would be an idiot because I'd be wasting money doing that. Um, but uh, in the digital era, I'm just hedging my bets and memory is cheap and I'm not gonna wear things out with that approach. So um, that, that ends up working really well to get tack sharp focus exactly where you need it to be. Not even by depending on the, um, the uh, manual focus of the lens, just by physically moving the camera forward and backward. Once you're roughly in the proper uh, you know, uh, focus uh, by, by adjusting the lens itself. Yeah, when uh, I first read the, the question, I was thinking about focusing, how it's easier to focus a macro by setting the reproduction ratio you want and then move the camera in and out. Right. And so, but sometimes you don't know what the reproduction ratio is. For example, how big is this flower? Um, mm -hmm. Am I going to take out a ruler and measure it and start doing some maths? No. Um, I'm just going to get it roughly in the ballpark of where it's going to fill the frame properly. Uh, and get a feel for that and then move the camera forward and backward when the focus is going to shift through that point. But this is really experimental. It's really got to be hands on. And the curiosities, I think, come up in some pretty meaningful and sometimes unexpected ways. Like I saw this 
uh, this image uh, just as, I mean, it's not a fantastic photograph, but it sparked my curiosity because uh, in the background, um, there was specular highlights on water droplets. Again, uh, my spray bottle comes, comes in handy. It's with me all the time. Uh, and so I sprayed this flower and it was kind of gem-like, but more so because the out of focus specular highlights in the background, they turned into hexagons. And I was so curious as to why. You know, you've got these interesting hexagonal shapes in the background. Well, long story short, the lens that I was using had a six bladed aperture. And so the out of focus highlights like that take on the shape of your aperture. So I start <laughs> testing this, right? Like any, any new idea, you gotta you know, take it back to the drawing board and figure it out. So I took this fiber optic lamp, which is a great random photographic subject, by the way. If you're ever bored and looking for <laughs> creative subjects, you could like knock this thing around over a timed exposure and have so much fun. Um, but that's it in focus. And I put it out of focus and I'm getting all of those geometric shapes. This particular lens, uh, has a heptagonal aperture. It has seven blades. So you see a seven sided shape, uh, hep uh, heptagons in the background. And uh, if I were to shoot that wide open, then uh, you, know, you know, as might be expected, the aperture blades are not engaged, making the aperture any smaller. So you get a circular shape, um, uh, which is, you know, you, obviously there's no geometry when the aperture blades are, are not uh, kind of narrowing things down farther. But this reminded me of, uh, of some things that I had seen where people really played heavily with the out of focus details and images, the bokeh, bokeh, however you want to pronounce it, but those out of focus details. And some lenses can do remarkable things, especially older vintage lenses um, that in the background here, um, this is a mineral sample. It's a piece of quartz crystal that's been sprayed with something to make it colorful. Uh, and all those crystal facets pushed completely out of focus uh, with a particular lens, mind you, create this beautiful texture in the background. Again, a good portion of macro photography is about those background elements and you know, embrace the background, control the background, create the background. And this was created with uh, an old triplet lens, the Trio Plan 100, uh, which was made by a German company, Meyer Optic. And they still make them today. Don't buy one. Um, the reason why I say that is because they cost a thousand dollars for a new one. You might be able to find a used one with the same name of Trio Plan on eBay for a couple of hundred dollars that you don't need to spend. And this was a, an interesting um, a shift for me because photographically, um, I always see somebody using a piece of equipment, or you know, you look at their EXIF data, you you see what camera settings they used, and you start to mimic, right? And before you get a a feel for it, but it's expensive to mimic that if you want to get exactly the same gear. I did. I regret it. I have buyer's remorse for purchasing that lens. Um, but I've got it, and I've used it a couple of times. Uh, I used it. I was growing some frost. Uh, got a big outdoor uh, shed that's unheated, and uh, I just put an ultrasonic humidifier out there one night, a uh, cold night in the wintertime, and I opened up the doors to that uh, uh, afterwards, and it was like, I don't know, magical. It was like Narnia. Like it was just crystals and beautiful and magic and sparkles, but um, it was mostly black and white. I again went back to my rock collection, found a mineral sample to stick in behind to make some nice colorful background to it, and away you go. But I, this lens, this old design, uh, is such coveted at such a price. And I thought, you know, there's probably a cheaper way to do it because they're old. Uh, and the optical formula in there is just a simple cook triplet. So I did some tests. I took again, one of those rock samples. It's just a great thing to put out of focus to, to test. This is with that Trio Plan 100, super expensive. And then I took another lens that I have right here on my desk. I'll show it to you in a minute. Um, and I took this as a comparison uh, shot and uh, very similar. In fact, I might even like it more. It's a little bit more sharp on the outer edges of, uh, of these circles. And in another test, this one was with the, uh, the Trio Plan 100. And you've got a, uh, an outer uh, edge border here uh, that has a bit of a rainbow color to it, which can work, but that's that same thing that's less sharp. Uh, whereas if I use my other lens that I discovered, those same features, they're a little bit sharper. They're less color separated, which I kind of liked. And that lens, uh, instead of costing you $1,000, um, sets you back about $15. 
does not have to be this one, this uh, Zetar uh, uh, f2.8 100 millimeter lens. Uh, it's a projection lens. So this is a lens from some uh, Soviet state from the 1970s or 80s. Um, and I bought it on eBay for 10 or $15, maybe 20 at the most. And I've bought a bunch of these, a whole bunch of different varieties. Some are metal, some are plastic. They all do nearly exactly the same thing. The reason why they're not purchased by photographers often is because they have this little barrel mount on them. Uh, this, this spiral thing that that's incompatible with any, okay, well, let's go to a camera store or even Amazon and say, let's buy an adapter for this. None exists. John, this is where you're going to kick yourself because the proper adapter is that Canon FD bellows, because all I have to do is slide this in the front of the bellows and tape it in place. And that's how I was making those other images. It worked perfectly fine. There was absolutely no hiccups or issues whatsoever. That antiquated bellow system, which again, you could probably pick up yeah. uh, you used for 60 bucks. It's not, not like you're heartbroken that you lost it, but. Oh no, uh, I might've probably sold it 30 years ago. <laughs> yeah, well, so you probably would have gotten a much prettier penny than what they're worth today. Right. <laughs> so good move. Um, but, but the idea of taking this lens, not because I'm telling you to buy this one specifically, just like I'm not telling you to buy the Trio Plan 100. I'm telling you to understand what both of them are is a simple triplet. And especially when they are incredibly affordable and you can stick them into old bellows that nobody cares about anymore and you can make something magical. The understanding of what the optics are doing and how it's relating to artistic effect. That's that mesh of art and science. And the more of that we can, we can weave together, uh, then the more magical I think the results are gonna be. Um, so but I, I will jump to the next slide just to wet your whistle for what will be coming next. Okay, I, I see will, Michael's I'll hand going up, up again. Questions. Yes, Michael, question. Can you go back to the uh, um, other, other image? So, oh, of this lens or the resulting yeah, no, 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 from... the lens, the lens. Yeah. Um, does that, I'm going to call it a snoot. Does that snoot come off? Does it, does it, does it? Oh, that, uh... that, that is the barrel of the lens. Uh, that, that, that is the, the lens itself. If I were to. There's more uh, elements in there. Uh, yeah. So if I were to, uh, to show you the lens here, the, the, the lens, it goes back to, and I don't mind sticking my finger in here because it's an old lens. It goes oh, back to okay. about that far. And, um, and does, does the front of that lens have a thread? There, well, the, the front of the lens, no, no thread. No thread on the front, no thread on the back, just a spiral connection on it that would have been for whatever projector it was designed to focus in. None of that matters anymore, which is why I just take the bellows and I just tape it in place uh, and I can adjust the distance of the bellows to adjust my focus on a macro scale. As long as, you keep that, as long as you keep that lens you know, uh, uh, flat to the surface of the bellows, Yes and no. If you don't, then you are playing with tilt shift macro photography, which is just as fun. When uh, you're playing with what? Tilt you're, shift. You're playing oh. with like a, a tilt <laughs> shift. Your focal plane won't be perfectly flat, but that doesn't mean you can't make magic with it because the whole point of using these cheap old optics is because they're imperfect, right? So if your focal plane is also imperfect, that's still perfectly okay. You're not breaking any rules in that process. So you don't have to be precise with it. So Anya was asking if you do any online workshops or teach one-on-one. -on -one. I do. Uh, so you can reach out to me personally for a one-on-one -on -one workshop, and I'm more than happy to entertain any ideas that you have for that right now, virtually, of course. Uh, and uh, for workshops, I just wrapped up one with Princeton Photo Workshop, uh, who I've done a lot of stuff in person in the past. This year, we've been doing online virtual workshops. And I don't know if their new dates are posted, but they will be later this year. Uh, and we've got at least two workshops coming up with Princeton Photo Workshop. So where is uh, where are they located? Uh, they're located in Princeton, New Jersey. However, oh, okay. the, the stuff that we're doing this year is all remote. So it doesn't matter where on the planet you are, mm -hmm. uh, so long as you're in a comfortable enough time zone, uh, then, then that would work just fine. Yeah. So I had people from New Zealand and Texas and elsewhere in the last workshop that we had done. So cool. uh, it, it's kind of freeing when people can come in from distant Does places. Canon know about you at all? Canon, see, I don't, <laughs> Canon, 
we had a love and hate relationship. I, I no longer shoot Canon, but it's only because, uh, uh, you know, I, I was courted by, by Lumix and Panasonic and they wanted to sponsor me after I was shooting with a, uh, a Lumix GX9 for about a year and they just loved my work and they thought, okay, well, you know, this guy might be good to sponsor. Partly because, Michael, I was shooting with the Canon 1DX and 1DX Mark II, which are great cameras, don't get me wrong. But when I'm shooting with a $7,000 camera body and I'm showing my work from that, it's a barrier right there where people say, ah, I don't have that camera, so I can't do what Don does. So for an entire year, I shot with a very small, not a flagship micro four thirds camera and did all of my professional work with that, which destroyed that barrier, right? Uh, and I, I admit that there are certain products that Canon has produced that I have been publicly frustrated with. Uh, and so they never approached me to be sponsored in any way. Great case in point, talking about macro work, their ring flash. Uh, especially their newest uh, MR 14 EX ring flash. And I'm just going to go on my How do you remember this crap? <laughs> I mean, uh, how do you remember this crap? I mean, I work for that company and I don't remember that nonsense. <laughs> no, no, I want to. I, you know, I got a photograph. Age dementia has not yet set in. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it, it's coming soon, though, Stephen. I've got a four and a half, almost five year old daughter that makes my thoughts so scatterbrained right now, it's hard to recollect them. Yeah, well, mine's um, 37 years old. <laughs> <laughs> a bit of a and Don, that's only through there. lack of sleep. No. <laughs> yes, they, well, this is true. Um, but so the MR14. The, the MR14 EX2, um, mm -hmm. they decided with a lot of their newer flashes to uh, to build in a thermal limiter, which makes sense because you don't want the, the hardware to overheat and then damage the hardware. Um, but they did so in a way that um, is ineffective. It's engineeringly cheap. And so they were cutting costs. Um, they put a counter in the software counting up the aggregate amount of exposure and associating that with their assumption of heat. Um, now, picture me outside minus 20 degrees Celsius photographing snowflakes. And my ring flash is giving me overheating warnings because it was counting the exposures and nothing more. And easy to reset and how I know it's a counter is if I unplug or uh, open the battery door while the flash is on and close it again, it resets the counter. Thereby, it's not a thermal sensor, it's a counter. Uh, yeah, and I, I was vocal about this. <laughs> and I was vocal about a few other issues I had with the Canon 24 to 105 L lens that I had to send back to replace twice because of a stupid ribbon cable that connects to the aperture assembly that at the extremes of the zoom will, will pinch slightly. And after three to three and a half years of constant use will snap. <laughs> and it needs to be replaced, but you can't replace the ribbon. You have to replace the entire aperture assembly. And then three and a half years after that, it broke again because the part that they replaced it with was the same part and they didn't fix the problem. So I'm off my soapbox. There's my <laughs> rant for you. Anyway, someone was asking me in a private, um, do, you, do you have a ring flash that you can recommend? I and I'm going to throw one that I've been using into the chat. It's it's a Canon dedicated, but I'm sure it would work with other um, flashes and it's on sale for just 55 bucks with free shipping. Now, uh, this flash, I'm just taking a look at it right now, John. Um, mm -hmm. Do you know if it uses xenon flash tubes or if it uses LEDs? This is flash tubes. This is not an LED. Good. And that's the reason why I ask is an LED ring flash might be great for video work, but do not use it for stills. Yeah, I have uh, an LED version of it. <laughs> uh, and, and so a, an LED flash has a much, much longer flash duration. And this is really important because... Uh, it, Fictional scenario here. Let's say you're in a room that has absolutely no light, not a stray photon of light anywhere around. And you you set a camera for a 10 minute exposure, okay? Well, you get nothing because there's no light. Um, <laughs> but if arbitrarily at some point during that 10 minutes, you pop a flash, what is your exposure? Is it- The flash duration. Or is it the flash duration? It's the flash duration. Uh, and so on a macro scale, your flash is usually point blank range and thereby usually pretty fast around one twenty thousandth of a second or so, uh, much faster than your fastest shutter speed. Uh, if you're using an LED based flash, it might be one one hundredth or one two hundredth of a second. And there's a big delta between those two. Uh, so if you translate that fictional 10 minutes to one two hundredth of a second or whatever your flash sync speed is that is your total duration of exposure 
Um, but the one that really matters is the flash duration for a very small subset of that, usually amounting to one ten thousandth of a second mm -hmm. or smaller. And so that's only possible with a xenon uh, flash tube ring flash, of which there are a lot. But just know that there's a difference there and seek out the knowledge of if it's LEDs or not, because you want those classic xenon. Yeah, and the LED tubes. one I have is constant. It doesn't even pretend to flash. Yeah, some of them, a lot of them do pretend to flash, and they can fool oh, wow. you if you're not paying attention. Um, there, there's another one that I've used, the uh, the Young Nuo uh, YN. 14 EX. Uh, they mimic the Canon branding uh, in terms of their model numbers. And in fact, it's better than the Canon version. Uh, and it's uh, it's not 50 bucks. I think it's 120 or something. Uh, yeah, this one's normally uh, 120, but they're on a closeout. That's why it's down to that's a good deal. 50. So yeah, I can't speak for it personally. Right. But uh, but I, I do know that uh, you you don't get tricked into buying the most expensive thing because it's probably not going to be the best solution. There's a law of diminishing returns in all things photography. Uh, and you know, just like this cheap projector lens, you can work magic with something so simplistic uh, and, and just have fun, right? It, we, we lose a lot of the fun in photography when we get you know, uh, buttoned down with all the gear and the settings and, and everything else. <laughs> Mucking with light can be enjoyable. Um, and so too, you know, in, in the case of, of this image here, um, I would consider this very seriously mucking with light in a way that's actually pretty easy to do with stuff that you might have around your house or you is can- a, Is that a vitamin? Um, very close, uh, Michael. This is citric acid, uh, but uh, a lot of uh, vitamins, amino acids, uh, you know, um, uh, different uh, things. When you create images like this, they're quite easy to, to produce. You could even smear some lemon juice uh, and, and make something similar. And I'll explain that process in just a minute. But this looks like abstract artwork. And in the past, I'd seen people doing this and I've seen their setups. And I was thinking, OK, um, that looks intimidating. How can I make it simpler? Well, I started simple and then I made it intimidating myself. But I'll show you how to make <laughs> it simpler than this, um, because this looks like oh. Don, I don't have that kind of gear. That looks like there's far more complexity within this than I can possibly imagine. Well, maybe, but take a look at the core ingredients. We've got a light shining up through a stack of stuff. And so it's just a flashlight, an LED flashlight. And it is a polarizing filter. Uh, now you'll notice that the polarizing filter is in a particular orientation. It's a circular polarizer, but the flashlight, the light is coming through where the lens would normally be. So uh, this orientation is important because a normal polarizing filter will uh, take light, polarize it, but scatter it on one side. So in this case, it stays polarized light in this orientation. And it goes up to this plate of glass that has another polarizing filter on top. And I've just made myself a makeshift polarizing microscope. And I'll show you an even easier way to do it. It gets so much simpler than this, but this is the core ingredients. And on that plate of glass is a liquid and it is just water with citric acid or any other type of household ingredient. Some cleaners will do this. Uh, as Michael mentioned, vitamins will create something similar. And I just place it on that slide with a pipette or an eyedropper or heck, just squeegee it out of a paper towel for all that matters. Just get it on there um, and, uh, and let it dry, let it evaporate. Because once it evaporates, the crystals will start to, uh, to deposit uh, and create some really fun structures. Sometimes in this case, um, I've, uh, I've greatly simplified the entire process because most LCD screens are polarized and thereby they are also a polarized light source. So you don't need a light or a polarizing filter in that equation. All you need, if you are a, a photographer that has a polarizing filter for your camera and you have a smartphone, that's all you need because you can just put the filter on top of your phone screen, just bring up something that's just white um, and put the, uh, the glass and it doesn't have to be a microscope slide. You could just take a plate of glass out of an old four by six picture frame or something. It doesn't, they, that's immaterial to the process either. In this case, these crystals are um, uh, a supplement called MSM. I forget what MSM stands for. It's a really big, long word. Um, I, I bought it at a, at a health food store uh, I melted it directly on that uh, on that slide. And seconds after removing it from the heat, it shattered into these beautiful crystals almost immediately. Uh, requires a bit of heat and do it outside in ventilation. Uh, same question, thing for this one. Uh, uh, yes, Michael. 
so you said you have to wait till it dries. Can you take these uh, microscope slides with the, with the liquid on it and put it in a microwave? Um, I haven't done that, but uh, that would be really interesting because the water would then boil. Uh, and that well, if you do it slowly. Well, a microwave only really has one setting. Uh, it's either on or off most microwaves. Panasonic microwaves behave differently uh, where they'll actually adjust their power. And I've seen some demos of this, but the average microwave will be on for two seconds and then off for five if you're in the defrost setting. But when mm -hmm. it's on for the two seconds, that's its maximum value. Um, and so it's on and off cycle averages things out, but individually um, it, uh, it wouldn't take much to boil a tiny little couple of milliliters of water on a microscope slide. So that might not be ideal, but you might get some chaotic crystals forming. So that could be interesting too. Um, you know, the, uh, you'd be better off uh, putting it on your stovetop on, on a simmer setting uh, and having that lower powered heat uh, apply to that transition. But even in this case, this is menthol crystals. Menthol will melt at around, I think, 40 or 50 degrees Celsius, maybe slightly more, but below the boiling point of water. So it just requires a little bit of heat they melt, and after about a half an hour, it creates these beautiful fern-like crystals. Um, and Bob in the chat says, MSM is methyl sulfonyl methane. Thank you for that, uh, <laughs> Bob. Occasionally used for the treatment of arthritis. Well, thankfully, I don't have arthritis, but I do have a bag full of MSM uh, that I can use for tons of different experiments. Sounds like Breaking Bad on HBO. <laughs> Just about, uh, or, you know, th this is an amino acid, uh, called beta alanine. And, mm. uh, that I think is something that you sh you're supposed to take before a workout to improve the results. I'm, I need to work on my cardio. Maybe this will help me, but, um, <laughs> I've only ever used it to put onto a microscope slide to create this particular effect that looks like a topographical map of the ocean floor or something. It's, uh, um, it's beautiful. It's abstract artwork. And, and I have a fun time just playing with these plates of glass, especially as an at home. If you're, if you haven't gotten your vaccine yet and you're still stuck at home and you're waiting for the world to return to normal, um, this is a really fun project to explore and experiment with. Um, this indeed. one again, uh, citric acid, uh, going back oh, to that old, okay. uh, faithful, uh, I've had a lot of success and I'll often set out like a dozen microscope slides and, uh, you know, set them up to dry overnight and uh, knowing that by the morning they'll all have evaporated. And that's, that's a good reason to, to want to get out of bed. You know, you just jump up and see what <laughs> creations you've discovered overnight. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, was there a, a couple other questions that come sure. in? Mark Milrod was asking, when working outside, I, I suppose, how do you deal with breezes? Uh, welcome to my nightmare. Um, <laughs> so there's, uh, when you're outside, it, well, there's, there's different seasons, right? So if I'm photographing a snowflake, I'm often right on top of it. So I'm blocking a lot of the wind and so on. But if there's any significant breeze, it's gonna blow away. Uh, and uh, I just don't shoot in those conditions because it would likely result in a fractured and broken snowflake to begin with. Um, but if I'm trying to control other elements, those third hand tools, great if something's low to the ground. Um, uh, Wimberly makes the plamp. Uh, like a clamp, but for plants, the plant clamp or plant mm -hmm. as they call it. Uh, that's just a little flexible arm uh, on like a gorilla pod like uh, flexible uh, uh, you know, system uh, that lets you hold a plant uh, you know, relatively still from the stem uh, without damaging it. And so there's that and I've used those before. But to be honest, you don't really have to worry about that if you're using flash because the flash is gonna freeze action so quickly. And if you're rapid fire shooting, um, uh, like that moving forward and backward through focus and taking a lot of shots, one of those shots will have the focus where you want and the <laughs> flash will negate any motion blur that would have come into the equation. Yeah, and you can, your flash recycle time is zero when you're in that close, so you can yep. shoot a lot faster. Michael. Uh, this, this brings up something that we discussed a couple of weeks ago. Do you have any concern or have you thought about Depth of depth of field. focus versus depth of field. For practical purposes, for this kind of work, they are equal. I mean, of course, depth of field is the amount that you have in focus uh, in the actual subject space itself. Uh, depth of focus is uh, is the the internal camera side of of that measurement. Right um, now. 
uh, unless you start measuring uh, entrance and exit pupil distances within your lenses, then uh, then going through that uh, uh, you know rat nest of, of equations and mathematics <laughs> is really non applicable to the final art side of things. Well, what I was getting to is that uh, um, have you noticed that not all of your lenses uh, are able to uh, uh, focus at the same uh, uh, depth of focus point. Right. Well, a, a typical macro lens will get to a one-to-one -one magnification, um, but that distance from the lens is going to vary based on its focal length. And so uh, a 180 or 200 millimeter macro lens, it's one-to-one -one magnification might be a meter away. Uh, but if you have a 15 millimeter macro lens, it's, it's, uh, one to one is like pretty well touching the front elements uh, or or thereabouts, right? So that the oh, that, that part I understand, but yeah. I'm, I'm talking about if you took if you took all of those um, uh, long macro lenses and you were to focus them at let's say I don't know um, thirty six millimeters away, uh, uh, would they all focus at the thirty six mil uh, uh, millimeter uh, point? Uh, 36 millimeters would be would be too close on on the uh, on the outside for a lens of that focal length. I do hear what you're saying though that uh, your depth of field is a variable that is concerned with a number of factors, not just your focus. Uh, not, not no, just your, the, uh, my depth of focus. Your depth, depth of focus is within the camera, and we don't really have any control over that. Right, but uh, depth of field, there's at least three variables that, that are uh, controlled with that. Your, your aperture, uh, mm -hmm. your focal length, and your distance from your subject. So those three things control uh, your depth of field, yet you don't have that same level of control over depth of focus, if that makes any sense. Yeah, I'm going to drop, the, drop this one. The depth of focus thing is, is, is different than the depth of field. But anyway, Melissa was asking if you've used the Liawa macro lens there, 100 millimeter 2.8. If that's worthwhile yep. looking at. Uh, I've, I've got it. And uh, uh, I, I, uh, I, I jumped ahead on my slides here because I want to get into okay. the next subject as well. But um, the, the 100 millimeter uh, f2.8, the reason why I love that lens uh, is partly because it's manual focus and you don't need autofocus in macro photography. I rarely, if ever, have used it. Um, but it breaks that one to one magnification barrier. It goes to two to one. It gets twice the magnification of the average macro lens without having to add close up filters or extension tubes or anything to augment the optical system. Uh, and I wish more lenses would do that. Uh, and more of them are starting to. The optics in that lens are pretty good. Uh, and the fact that it doubles your magnification while still achieving infinity focus is a nice asset to have. Cool. So let's go back to your presentation. Sure, because we, we got to talk about water droplet refraction photography, <laughs> which I think is a ton of fun. And an image that you're seeing here is pretty well straight out of camera. I might have cropped it or done some basic adjustments in Lightroom, but there's nothing tricky, nothing fancy uh, about this kind of imagery. Um, it's just how you put the subject together. Uh, and, and in this sense, um, it's not about the photography as much as it is uh, being a uh, droplet architect, uh, you know, uh, constructing a scene that is worth photographing, and then the photography comes in as a second step. Uh, so we can talk about how some of those different elements come together, uh, like this blade of uh, blue fescue, bluegrass, which has a powder like coating on it that is hydrophobic, that water wants to, uh, you know, beat up and roll off of rather than kind of soak in. Uh, and it creates these very spherical type water droplets. And I put it in a bowl of water. Again, bowls of water on my kitchen table end up being a common theme for a lot of my macro photography. Um, around the same time of the year, I guess, because there's an Easter basket in the background. Uh, but the, the idea here is that it's just a core set of very simple ingredients that come together. It takes me three or four hours to construct this, right? I, partly because I don't know what I'm making. Uh, I come up with an, I, I, an idea. The idea is, okay, um, uh, reflections and refractions in the same image, go. Uh, and that could be anything from water or, you know, reflective mylar, uh, mylar or mirrors or, um, you know, a, a blade of grass, but it could be uh, the surface of water with a mirror or all these different ingredients that, that could come together. And I just sit and I tinker away. Um, and hours go by and I arrive at something like this. Or... Uh, something like this here, which interestingly enough, 
was not created with a macro lens, uh, nor any uh, additions to the optical path at all in order to make this as a macro image. I'll show you the ingredients that go into this. Um, it's pretty simple. You've got the, uh, I'm shooting with a Lumix S1R uh, and their kit lens, a 24 to 105 F4 lens. For lighting, I've got uh, a Platypod uh, Max as a, as a base, and they've they actually had this as a kit. I don't know if they've kept this on. It was a really cool kit around Black Friday that they had that had the base, the gooseneck arms, the Lytra um, torches, which are waterproof as well. I don't mind getting those things soaking wet. Uh, and so if you were just looking at that for the lighting uh, from the Platypod setup, you'd think, oh, well, I'm photographing that flower until I outline with this little magenta box here that I'm actually photographing a tiny little seed that I'm, uh, that I'm imaging just on the surface of the water. And that's what you, uh, what, what you saw in, in this image here. Now, another scenario, uh, very uh, similar or simple setup. And again, I use what I have lying around me. Like if a clothespin is gonna do the job, then a clothespin does the job. Uh, you know, it's, it's just part of what's, what's available. And so I've got a, uh, a yellow goat's beard seed, um, which uh, it's also a root vegetable called salsify, which you can buy the seeds of and plant in your garden common in Europe, not so common in North America. Um, but they have this kind of spiderweb-like seed. Um, and so a flashlight that's pointed on the background, decidedly almost entirely on the background and not on the seed itself. And then if I frame that up and take that image, then this is what I get. Now, this is not done with a macro lens, the uh, 24 to 105 kit lens. They put the word macro on it, which <laughs> It's uh, I, it's a bit of a pet peeve of mine. Uh, Me too. <laughs> because it's not a macro lens if it doesn't get to one-to-one -to -one magnification, which is the definition of macro, life size. Um, and so many manufacturers do it. And Nikon is bad because they use micro when it doesn't get closer than one-to-one. -one. And <laughs> anyway, I'll get off that soapbox. But the point is that it does get a little bit closer, but this is as close as I can get. The thing is, the camera that I'm using has a high resolution mode. And it's becoming more and more commonplace that uh, micro four thirds cameras, uh, full frame cameras from uh, Panasonic, from Sony, even Fuji with their GFX series have started building in this high resolution mode where uh, if a camera has a uh, built in uh, in body image stabilizer, then it can shift the sensor left, right, up and down. And if it can take, uh, Sony does 16, my camera does eight separate shots by slightly moving the camera sensor by sub-pixel shifts. And it'll take eight different images and combine them together to quadruple the resolution of the, uh, of the sensor, uh, you know, in effect. So my 47 megapixel image becomes 187 megapixels, which is pointless. I don't need 187 megapixels for anything unless I'm doing like artwork reproduction work. And even then I probably don't need that much. But from a macro photographer's perspective, we can thread the needle between uh, magnification and diffraction. So in this case, if I have 187 megapixels, I can throw away 90% of that. And I would find myself in the realm of between 18 and 20 megapixels, which is where I was for the bulk of my professional career. Right? But I would inherently be much further away from the subject. The closer you get with macro work, the shallower your depth of field becomes. So if I get further away and I crop in, then that gives me the ability to forego focus stacking and all sorts of complex editing um, and, uh, and worrisome efforts where I don't have to crop in nearly that much. But if I just crop into this level and all I've done is cropped, and again, maybe some basic adjustments in Lightroom uh, to get the exposure where it is, but that's it. There's no, this is a single image straight out of camera uh, using the high resolution mode without shooting with a macro lens at all. The same thing was done here for this image. And, uh, and this particular image, I, I learned that I, my aperture was probably a little bit too small. It was only F14, but when my pixels get that small, diffraction starts to blur things a little bit. And if I were to reshoot this, I might reshoot it at F8 or F9, uh, I'd lose a little bit in the depth of field, which is almost complete here, but I would increase my, uh, my resolution a little bit in that process. Um, and so uh, it's always a learning uh, experience for me when you start ex experimenting with new tools and new techniques and so on. Uh, but there's just so much to explore with all of this. And, and I do wanna, if I'm allowed, John, uh, can, can mm -hmm. I plug my upcoming book? Of course. 
because um, uh, this details all of that. And, and then some. Uh, it, is, it is a book that I have uh, coming out. I actually have a, uh, a pre-pressed copy of it in my hands right now, a content proof that I've been going through and making some subtle changes that will, uh, that will result in the, the final product, uh, hopefully hitting press within, uh, within the month. Uh, and I uh, just got to get that all scheduled in. But skycrystals.ca is where you can take a look at that. It's yeah, if you want to pop that into the chat. Uh, yeah, let's, uh, let's go uh, to everyone here to dot sky crystals dot ca uh and that the url uh is from my uh um uh, my first book on on snowflake photography uh and uh bob asked me in a direct message uh was this the gofundme project well i didn't use gofundme i used kickstarter but yes this was my my book on kickstarter which is now um you know it's complete. I'm just uh, worrying about the the final bits and pieces before ink hits the paper on the press, which I'm really thrilled about. Um, and the book also covers one other element of of macro photography that very few people have have explored, have considered exploring, and that has to do with um, uh, ultraviolet fluorescence. And this is a row of impure diamonds, just rough diamonds. You can buy them in little baggies of 300 of them for 20 bucks on eBay from the, wherever they mine them in Pakistan or India um, that are mostly throwaway uh, because of their size and impurities. But if I turn off my room lights and I turn on ultraviolet lights, these things produce a light show. Uh, and uh, it's not just very tiny mineral uh, minerals. Uh, it is flowers, you know, like this um, uh, this succulent uh, from South Africa. Regular light, it's not a bad looking flower. Turn off the lights, turn on the uh, ultraviolet lights, and it turns into a floral aurora of sorts, uh, which I really quite enjoy the look of. And it's not hard to do this. Um, now, I've, I actually did it the hard way first. I uh, built my own ultraviolet uh, flashes. And, uh, you know, I, I, even have, I even have one of them here um, that I might show you. It doesn't, you're seeing a picture of it. It doesn't you know, make any difference if I hold it up. Um, but these, uh, these UV flashlights, uh, this Convoy S2 that I have here in the foreground or a Convoy C8 in the background, Google them. You'll find them from Chinese manufacturers. You might find them on eBay or Amazon. But... Um, they're good. Uh, they're really good for this type of work uh, and fairly inexpensive, between 50 and 100 bucks uh, to explore an entirely new area of photography. Now, if you don't wear prescription eyewear, uh, pick up a pair of UV protective glasses. You just don't want to shine UV light in your eyes. Um, and so there's my, uh, uh, there's my liability waiver right there. Uh, protect your eyes, people. But in doing so, this dainty white flower turns into this beautifully separated color palette with white hot pollen and, and purplish blue petals. Uh, or in the case of, of this flower, this is one of the ugliest flowers I've ever seen in, in regular ordinary light. Can anybody guess what this is a flower from? Any guesses? Looks like a zucchini flower. You got it, John. Um, <laughs> this is a zucchini flower. And um, zucchini flowers, if you've uh, ever seen them, they're just a yellow blob. Uh, and they are they bloom for half a day, and then they shrivel up. And uh, they're edible. In fact, they're delicious. But they're ugly. Um, and, and so when you hit them with the ultraviolet light, and you see this beautiful pattern show up, and the, these colors that you, know, you wouldn't have expected, that it was a lot of fun. Um, certain flowers uh, behave differently. This is a, a garden variety sunflower from some ever-bearing sunflower that I got at the garden store. And yeah, I've got three big flashes here. Forget about that. Substitute that with like one of those LED flashlights and you can just move it around and light paint and, and so on. But you see the back of, of the camera. Uh, again, this is when I was shooting with that Lumix GX9. Uh, you know, it doesn't require anything super fancy in terms of the camera gear. Uh, the back of the camera is showing you this. Now, this is the image with the regular room lights on. So if I turn off those room lights and I turn on my ultraviolet light, then this transitions into this. And I would call that transformative, right? You wouldn't, uh, you wouldn't expect oh, wow. that to be the same subject uh, from one to the next. And, but it's just that same sunflower. Now, yes, I chose this one because it wasn't fully bloomed and I wanted the, in, uh, the internal bending 
petals to break the pattern uh, of uh, of symmetry and so on and so forth. I'm using, you know, photographic, uh, you know, compositional rules here. Can you go back but, to the previous one? Of course. Yeah, that's that's the original one. Uh, okay. And and I'm not saying that that's a bad image, um, but but it has nowhere near the gravity as as this one. Uh, in terms of, of the colors and the otherworldly nature uh, that, that it seems to possess. It, it looks like it should be, uh, you know, out of Avatar or something else. Um, Sorry, where, was the, where was the ultraviolet light located in that BTS shot? Uh, so there, there, there's the, the setup. I've, I, again, you don't need these very expensively modified flashes. Just flash lights would work just fine. And in fact, one of them would work fine if you just moved it around in your hand during a longer exposure as a light painting endeavor. Um, you'll notice that I have a, um, uh, a piece of black felt that I would drape over everything to make sure that no light from the windows or anything else would, would come into. Uh, that was just a, you know, a little addition from the craft store. But, uh, but no, that transitions to this with regular light as I'm framing it up. And in this case, I'll, I'll test my focus. You know, I'll make sure that my depth of field, my camera settings to get that depth of field and focus proper are fine here before I turn off the lights uh, and it becomes this. Now, keep in mind, all you need is an ultraviolet light source because what you're capturing here is visible light. You don't need a modified camera. You don't need special filters. You don't need special lenses. Your regular camera, your regular lens, no special filters or anything required for this because this is ultraviolet fluorescence. Uh, when ultraviolet light hits this flower, um, the, the atoms in the flower get excited or rather the electrons do in those atoms. And uh, with that excitation, they go to a slightly higher orbit, but for a very brief, nearly instantaneous period of time. And then they decay back down to their original orbit and in doing so release energy. But some energy was spent going up to that higher orbit. So, they release energy at a slightly uh, longer wavelength of light. So the ultraviolet light becomes visible light in the process. So that I should, should have put a propeller hat on for that explanation. <laughs> but uh, the thing is, you're using ultraviolet light to induce a visible fluorescence in the subject. And so your camera is just your regular camera that you've been using for everything always. Um, can can and, I make uh, one criticism? Yeah, Stephen. UV is not light. It's part of the electromagnetic spectrum that includes yes. what yes. we consider to be visible light. But if we use the word visible light, then it determines the fact that there might be other kinds of light as well within that de narrow definition. Yeah, um, visible light is redundant. <laughs> visible light is redundant, but uh, based on what we see with our own eyes, uh, an insect can see ultraviolet light directly. And so to call it ultraviolet light because an insect might be able to perceive it as light where we cannot, um, well, we can go into the semantics of it all, but yeah, you uh, have to forgive me for my scientific background, but I would always <laughs> say UV ra radiation. Fair enough. Fair enough. Um, well, in this case, we have lots of UV radiation, Stephen, uh, hitting <laughs> this, uh, uh, hitting this, uh, passion flower. And uh, it is a colorful flower on its own. Don't get me wrong. It's got some nice tones to it. But um, if, uh, if I, again, very similar to the previous setup, I, I turn off the room lights and I uh, turn on those ultraviolet lights and I get this uh, as, as a result. What's on and, the front of those? What's on yeah, the front you... of those? What's on the front of those uh, uh, strobes? So I, I, I've custom modified those flashes. They are, um, so b basically what, what they are is a young Nuo flash. This one, the battery yeah. door broke. So I taped that one up too. Um, if I were to take this apart, you'll notice that you would just see the bare flash bulb inside because I've removed anything blocking that in the process and the optical. So the Fresnel lens and all that other stuff the is Fresnel gone. Fresnel lens, everything's gone. Uh, so that, it, because those things block or otherwise absorb mm -hmm. ultraviolet radiation, Stephen. Um, and, <laughs> and so uh, in that, in that sense, uh, they're doing um, their intended purpose. You don't want to give a sunburn to the back of your retinas, et cetera. Um, but uh, you remove those and then you put on filters that block all of the visible spectrum of light. Uh, and there's a two filter set that go into here because I couldn't find one filter that did it perfectly. Uh, one had a little bit of a light bleed on the red side, one a little bit on the purple side, but together they cancel out their bleeds and you get a really nice um, uh, ultraviolet light source. So, so what are those filters? Oh, you don't want to know. Um, <laughs> are they gelatin? 
No, they're, they're, no, they're, they're real glass. filters. If, if you want to know, one is a Midopt BP365 and the other one is a Hoya U340. But <sighs> the thing is that they're expensive. <laughs> To uh -huh. make one of these costs like six hundred dollars, uh, and so you don't want to make one of these when the fifty dollar <laughs> ultraviolet uh, flashlight. LED flashlight does the same thing. So uh, when I've used these, it's if I had a moving subject, that's great, that's fine. The moving subject might need this, but if you don't need it, do not bark up that tree. <laughs> so basically, okay. the flashlight I bought when I moved to Arizona to find um uh bugs uh, um uh, scorpions scorpions they fluoresce i could get I, another couple of those and and do the job no um partly because those uh, the ones designed to find uh, scorpions in your garage steven or uh you know dog pee on carpets they you know they, they serve multiple purposes um they bleed a lot of light into the visible spectrum it's specifically purples and blues and stuff and that doesn't matter for scorpions but it does matter when you're trying to photograph just the fluorescence of the subject uh, because if it's spilling a lot of visible light into the image on its own um then that's going to contaminate your results so uh, not every UV light is made uh, equal. Uh, the Convoy S2 and Convoy C8 that I had mentioned previously, those ones I know have a good filter in front of them and a good quality LED diode um, that, uh, that are filtered down quite nicely. So um, those ones are, uh, they position themselves around uh, 365 nanometer, which is long wave UV, um, which a lot of organic stuff uh, fluoresces under. You can get shorter wave UV stuff that's much uh, more dangerous to work with in certain scenarios. Um, minerals will uh, exhibit certain phenomena there, but no organic material necessarily does. So that should answer your question there, Bob, about the uh, wavelength for those. What UV about lights. all black light tubes from the 60s? Those will typically use woods glass uh, as a, as a as a filter system, which also bleeds a fair amount of purple. Okay. Um, so they're not perfect, especially like if you've got a mineral sample that vibrantly fluoresces or something neon like highlighter ink and so on, mm -hmm. it's fine. But for organic things where the fluorescence is more subtle, the c color contamination is really going to hurt you. Great, thank you. You're very welcome. Um, let's uh, go back to sharing this uh, um, uh, passion flower that fluoresces to, to look like this. But you'll notice something fairly specific. It, you wouldn't have noticed in the behind the scenes setup, but when I was taking this picture, you look at the very bottom of the frame here, you'll see this uh, sort of rectangular thing that the camera's on. That's a focusing rail, but the camera is not mounted on the focusing rail in a way that you would expect to move forward and backward. It's mounted in a horizontal left and right orientation. Why would I do that? Well, that's because I can take this image, but I can also move the camera slightly to the left or the right, and I can take a partner image. And I can shoot things in stereoscopic 3D very easily using these techniques. So try this. Um, uh, this is a stereoscopic image pair, but the left image is on the right side and the right image is on the left side. So your intention here is to cross your eyes. If you're near a big screen, you might have to pull back a little bit, but if you cross your eyes such that you see three images, Focus on the image in the middle. It will be a 3D pop-out image of the effect. Um, sort of like crossing your eyes with just one thing, you'll see double vision. Well, the double visions overlap here, and you'll be able to see this in 3D. Now, don't beat yourself up if you can't see it, because only about 50% of the population can, and those that can might take a bit of extra effort in order to get this to work. I see Douglas in the chat saying that it does work for you, so that's great. Um, and so down the rabbit hole we go in macro <laughs> photography, uh, where there are so many wonderful different things to go through. And if, if uh, uh, Douglas could get this, here's one more just for good measure. Um, this is a freezing soap bubble on a flower in stereoscopic 3D, because uh, some people have called me the mad scientist of macro photography, and I really have to live up to that moniker. Um, so there you go. Uh, 3D uh, is... It's probably not going to make a comeback, but I love shooting stereoscopic 3D. So what's the typical offset between eyes to, to, to shoot, it, to move them? Totally depends on, uh, on what you're doing. On this scale, uh, this is only uh, maybe a centimeter or two apart. 
Um, okay. But on a human interocular distance, it would be about seven centimeters apart. Um, and so I've got some lenses and cameras and stuff in stereo 3D that will have that for a larger scale thing. But for a lot of the macro stereo equipment that I would use, I have some lenses that have two two lenses inside the same barrel, uh, which is what I used for this because I need each image needed to be taken at the same time. Uh, and those are hard to find archaic constructs of a bygone era. But uh, like the previous image, because it was static, all I had to do was move the camera slightly left and right in order to create uh, And you can take multiple images, you move a little bit, move a lot, take five or six images along the way and combine the two together that have the best distance to give you the best depth for your own perceptions. So that brings us to uh, to a few final uh, thoughts and processes. Very simple, but I just want to kind of show you how I can combine some of these ideas and uh, methodologies together. Here we have uh, a mineral sample. This is a chunk of cerocyte. It's a lead ore variety that this particular one happens to fluoresce uh, a color very similar to the yellow of the sun. Uh, and it's nuzzled into some Spanish moss with some Irish moss flowers just kind of poking around it as if um, to uh, resemble heliotropism where plants and flowers and stuff chase the, the sun through the sky to like bend towards it and, and they'll uh, work themselves towards the, the sun. W what if the sun had gone out and this little rock was glowing and it does glow brightly and it was the only light source in the image? Well, then you would see this as, as a result. Um, where all of the flowers are bending in towards the light source. And it's a completely constructed image, right? You know, in no way would you ever find this in nature. Uh, but that's what I can create when I kind of put the art into photography and mesh those things together. Um, one more, also with those ultraviolet flashlights, I tend to go out in my garden every couple of weeks and see what's blooming, uh, always planting new things. And if there's a new flower that happens to fluoresce, like this uh, gooseneck glue strife, um, it produced a light show. Uh, this is just regular light. It's okay. It, uh, it's kind of an invasive flower. I don't want too much of it. But uh, in fluorescence, it is like fireworks going off. And so I saw this image and I was thinking mm. to myself, you know, I, I, I went to bed with this image in my mind, uh, you know, or at least what I had seen outside in the garden, thinking, okay, what, what can I do? How can I make an image from this? I mean, it's cool as it is, but I was thinking... All right, well, I've got, I've got this geode and it's open on both sides. It's kind of like a tunnel of crystal. And I, was, I bought it a while, like years ago, thinking, yeah, I'm going to use that for something one day uh, for a photo uh, experiment. I'd never found something to, to use it with. Now I was thinking, what if, what if I were to take some of those flowers and stick them inside this tunnel? Like they're blooming from the crystals. But this opening on that side, that looks like... Uh, it, uh, it could fit that, uh, that probe lens, that Liowa 24 millimeter probe lens right inside that front. Because uh, it looks like it, that opening is big enough that I can fit that right inside there. So I take that lens and I stick it in there. And then from the other side, put my ultraviolet flashlight. Uh, then I can, I can make some magic. But there's always hiccups along the way. For one, this particular lens has an LED light ring built into it. Now, white LEDs are actually... Uh, ultraviolet LEDs that fluoresce through phosphors and things that produce uh, uh, regular light as a process, which means that even if that's off, but I shine my uh, ultraviolet flashlight on it, they glow. They glow a much more orange color than normal. And I'm thinking, okay, uh, problem or advantage here? Uh, do I tape around the thing to let the lens go free, but block those? No, just let's leave them and let's, let's build this setup where it looks like there's some sort of molten rock inside of this geode at this point, because the LED light on one side is not only illuminating the flowers through fluorescence, um, but it's also causing the end of the lens to fluoresce orange, <laughs> which created this as a, as a resulting image where you've got this you know, wonderful juxtaposition of this warmth and coolness where these fluorescing flowers are um, amongst all of these crystals and um, that's where creativity takes me. 
that's where the art of photography really, uh, you know, I, that I embrace that the connection of understanding the science, the optics, how all these puzzle pieces fit together. Um, and, uh, and that uh, brings me to one final plug of my book, because all that stuff is in here. Um, if you're at all curious about how I put any of this magic together, soup to nuts, it's all there. Uh, there's uh, 87,000 words in the book, in addition to all the images. It's not just a pretty picture book. So if you're at all curious, you can check that out and fully explore uh, what I call the universe at our feet. I have a, I have a feeling that Stephen Shore's mind is on overload. <laughs> How did you guess? Just I saw the steam coming out of your ears. Oh, I'm going. It, it, to, I'm going to say another six. In another six weeks, I'm going on vacation to Barbados, and I'm trying to figure out right now what which of these items I should be buying before I leave. <laughs> You're going, to be stopped at, you're going to be stopped at customs, but have a good time at uh, Sam Lord's Castle. <laughs> well, Giant. actually, where we stay, oh. where we stay is about 100 yards from Sam Lord's Castle. Yeah, I'm, On the going, beach. To jump in. I'm going to jump in. Yes. Also, number one, your work is absolutely incredible. Oh, thank you, Ian. Uh, I'm happy I've tuned into this because mm -hmm. it, is, it has indeed ruled out me ever attempting to try it. <laughs> <laughs> so I feel greatly relieved. Uh, but I do have a couple of questions. Uh, number one, uh, what uh, I'm interested in your post processing. What programs? I assume I assume you're shooting in RAW. Um, what is your uh, uh, programs that you're using to shoot in RAW? And are you getting the color rendition and contrast and so forth um, pretty much straight out of camera? I hate saying straight out of camera. Or are you having to adjust it to your vision? Uh, yeah, great questions, Ian. Uh, uh, number one, I shoot raw, uh, partly because there's no traditional white balance uh, that you might find uh, useful to get the right skin tone or the right, uh, you know, landscape color without a color cast or architecture with some level of neutrality within the image, um, especially of the ultraviolet fluorescence. Um, the images on the back of the camera are often different than what I perceive with my own eyes, simply because it's just unpredictable. Um, so the white balance doesn't have a target. It's more of what I remember it being. So it's very helpful that I I edit very shortly after I shoot with some of those images so that I have a, a mental note of what it should be like. So but you're like an impressionist. Sort of. Uh, but you have to be because again, we're, we're bending reality when, when it comes down to this. And, and the mm -hmm. color science for cameras were not meant to be fully saturated with particular wavelengths of blue that don't normally show up in nature. Uh, and so you kind of have to break the mold a little bit. I, I use Photoshop and, and thereby Lightroom as, as a raw processor. Um, but I've been using um, uh, on one photo raw quite a bit for those extreme difficult ones. They just handle the raw data a little bit better uh, in terms of the extreme uh, color gamut images. And, and in fact, I've actually had some examples in uh, in, in Adobe system where moving their uh, noise reduction slider up actually added noise to the image. And I have no idea why it was just a, an out of, uh, an, just sort of out of use case type of thing. Um, and I couldn't reduce the noise in the image. And it was, it was difficult because I had to shoot at a very high ISO because I was using these flashes for an insect. And so I, the, the shot was like four or 5,000 ISO. Um, and I used on one photo raw to handle the noise reduction in that image properly. Um, so it's not necessarily that I go to one tool always. If that tool fails, I find another tool uh, uh, that will uh, you know, work for me. And then I complain, I write some angry emails and, and I never get a response, but I still write the angry emails as part of the process. <laughs> so this, this sounds like when I shoot fireworks because it's the same problem. Yeah. So in follow idea. up to that, um, do you it, it, what monitor are you using and do you find a monitor is color critical for you it is well to, to a degree i mean uh i do a lot of my own printing too so there's an entire you know sort of chain of custody to keep in mind when you're going all the way down um asus makes their pro art monitors which i find once calibrated with an external uh, calibrator they are as good as you can get without spending 10 times the price um, and so the Asus ProArt displays, I've got a 32 inch 4K display here. 
And as soon as they roll out a five or six K monitor, I'm buying it. Um, I've, I've used their displays for a long time. I use x um, uh, I one, uh, display devices to, to calibrate it. Uh, but I'll be honest. I like those calibrators. They've got lots of uh, toggles and buttons and knobs and levers for me to to, to fiddle with. And uh, as a total photo geek, I love that. Um, but any calibrator will work. Um, so long as you're taking that extra step and you're calibrating uh, your display, and it's a display that is capable of being properly calibrated, like a laptop display, you might not even want to bother. Um, a regular, uh, just you know, run-of-the-mill monitor that costs you, you know, 150 bucks or what? Don't even, don't even use that. Um, just get something good to start with, and know that they do drift over time. So I'll recalibrate every couple of months. Maybe I should do it more frequently, but uh, only when I notice things kind of drift a little bit will I will I do that. And are you selling? Well, te your technically, I technically I would say you're not really calibrating the display unless you actually are calibrating it. What you're doing is very accurately profiling the state of the display. And that will change on a relatively quarterly basis. A lot of temperature and humidity can impact uh, the actual output from displays. This is true. You are, uh, I mean, I, I will adjust in the, the software for the, the, the calibration system. It will ask me to adjust the, uh, the RBG gains. So I guess there's some level of calibration therein. Um, but then it, yeah, it, it knows what color of blue it's sending to the screen. Uh, and then it knows what color of blue it's detecting off of the screen. And there's a delta between the two of them and it runs and that's through what this. And that's what creates the profile. Exactly. And um, Photoshop and Lightroom and pretty much all the um, uh, imaging applications need to have a very accurate profile uh, so you know that you're seeing what you're seeing. Exactly. Uh, Ian, I, was there another question as well? Here, could I step in for just a second? Because sure. it's actually anytime we are profiling a monitor, what we're actually doing is uh, calibrating it first and then profiling the result. So. It's a two-step process internal to the software, and that's what the X-Rite software and many others do. Yeah, uh, and, and Ian, I, sorry, I, you, you're cut off there. I'm curious what your final thought was. Well, I was also going to say, uh, number one, my profile is bigger around the middle than it used to be. Number two, <laughs> um, um, are you selling your uh, prints as limited editions? Are you represented in galleries or? Uh, I have been in a number of galleries, although a lot of that stuff is somewhat curtailed uh, during the pandemic time. So I'm looking forward to picking that up again. Um, but uh, limited editions, I'm not sure I necessarily believe in unless there's a reason to, uh, to, to artificially limit the number of prints produced. I, I will produce a numbered certificate for every print that I produce. And so you might get print number one. That's fine. But I'm not going to stop it at 10. You know, uh, un unless somebody wants to buy all 10 and say, okay, well, you know, don't make any more and then they'll pay a pretty penny. I don't feel like there's a reason why I should artificially limit that. Uh, artificially controlled scarcity uh, was the downfall of Beanie Babies and so many other things that, yeah, it doesn't mean that it's worth any more just because I chose not to print that many of them. Um, there have been some cases where I've done like a one of one print. Um, a great example, it's, it, you can't quite see it behind me, but there's, there's a snowflake print on the wall that actually has the real snowflake embedded in, uh, like I've, I've got one example here. It's a snowflake that is basically a snowflake fossil um, that is encased in resin. And so I've done a few of these where I've photographed the snowflake and then I've moved it to a plate of glass where I've put a scientific resin on top and I've preserved it like a fossil. And then I've put that in the frame with the image and that is deserving of a one of one limited edition. Uh, but unless you're going to those extremes and you're adding something that uniquely identifies it as a unique piece, um, you know, don't, uh, don't artificially create scarcity. That's such a cool idea. That is really cool. Mm -hmm. I like <laughs> so Bob had a question at three watt, 365 nanometer UV flash. Like you really need that much power and more Bob. Um, so, I mean, I've often used a two or three of these flashlights at the same time or a longer exposure. If I'm using just one at a base ISO, I might be shooting at 30 seconds worth of an exposure. 
um, because some subjects just don't fluoresce a whole lot. Uh, others fluoresce vibrantly. If you're using things like invisible ink or highlighter ink or uh, you know known artificial fluorescence or some minerals that are just vibrant, like fireworks going off, that's fine. Um, but for a lot of the organic fluorescence, it can be pretty dim. Uh, and the more power that you have behind it, the better, uh, or the longer the exposure, you know, one way or the other. But um, yeah, uh, I've, I think I've got the five watt versions of those UV flashlights. And, even and those are Convoy was the brand you mentioned, Convoy, right? Convoy, C-O-N-V-O-Y. Yeah, I put a I link earlier. A, I don't think it's a brand. I think it's a, a name that a lot of the Chinese manufacturers just kind of gather behind. What, uh -huh. was, the um, what, so, what was the name of the, uh, the, uh, the solution that, um, wouldn't let the water droplet go into the stem. Hydrophobic? Uh, uh, what the, the, it was just plain old tap water that I was using, but the surface was hydrophobic. It just means that the, the surface didn't want water uh, yeah, 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 to absorb yeah. into it. So but is there a particular, is there a particular chemical or, or uh, a solution? H2O. Just water, plain old tap water. No, no, if no. I'm getting, no, if I'm getting fancy, I might use bottled water. But no, no I think the, I think he's no. asking the surface. Do you prepare the surface, or is the nope. surface itself hydrophobic? The the surface itself is hydrophobic. Uh, uh. So uh, blue grasses, eucalyptus leaves, spider webs, uh, wildflower seeds, etc. They're all naturally hydrophobic surfaces. Um, you can possibly take some of that Rainex stuff that you put on your car windshield to make the water right. droplets beat up and roll off. That's right. it's a hydrophobic. Uh, uh, surface modifier. Um, right. I've never used that though. Uh, so your mileage may vary with it. Yeah. So a question about focus stacking. If you do it like in Photoshop, do you auto align the layers first and then auto merge or do you auto merge take care of the alignment? Or is there a certain order of operations? Uh, whoever asked that question should That's buy me. my book. Um, so John, <laughs> you should get that book. But I will. The, the, now, the, the idea is that um, uh, you'll bring the images in, you'll align them. Chances are, especially if you were shooting handheld, you might not have gotten every frame that you need. There might be some missing pieces. Mm -hmm. So you'll just blend it and you'll just see what the results are. Uh, and it will almost always show you some missing slices of focus along the way. It's perfect because then you can go back to Lightroom or whatever your digital asset manager is and find the missing slices, add them to your selection. Uh, so then you can go back into Photoshop. But when you do that, then you'll auto align the, the layers now that you know that you've got them all. And then you'll duplicate your entire layer stack so that you have two sets that are mm -hmm. completely aligned. Then you'll auto blend one set and then flatten that to a single layer. That's going to be your foundation layer. Uh, Photoshop will have some mistakes. Any photo uh, focus stacking algorithm will, whether you're using Zarine Stack or Helicon Focus, there's reasons why they have multiple focus stacking modes because there's no such thing as a perfect one. Um, and so in Photoshop, its version is also not perfect. I stick that at the very bottom of all of the other layers. And then I turn off the visibility of every layer going up. And then I work from the bottom up, turn on a layer, create a layer mask and flip it back and forth and see what parts of that slice of focus are better than Photoshop's rendition of it. Mm -hmm. And I paint it in with a layer mask and I go up and I keep going up and it's hierarchical. If I find a better fix higher up on the stack, it's gonna supersede anything that was lower. Um, and that's how you get perfect, pixel perfect focus stacking results is in Photoshop uh, by having the exact same set of aligned images that you can paint in the fixes manually on a per pixel basis if you really want to, to make sure that everything is exactly the way that it should be. So how much is the book? It is currently $62.99 Canadian. Canadian. Uh, so all of you in the US, there is a discount on that based on the exchange. Um, and that price is going up to $75 as soon as it starts shipping, which is in hopefully less than a month. Uh, You're Canadian so it, or US? Canadian. Uh, $62.99 Canadian dollars, because I'm up here uh, in America's hat. Cool. Well, does anyone else have any other questions? I mean, we've gone for an hour and an hour 40 here. I don't yeah, know how much time uh, you had. Is that your first Kickstarter the, for the book? or, or... It's my first uh, Kickstarter. Uh, my first book on Snowflake specifically. I think I've got a copy of it here. It's, it's out of print. So this is my, my personal copy. This was Sky Crystals, which was my first one. Uh, and uh, that was done on Indiegogo in 2013 as when I published that. And that was a 300 odd page book um, that detailed 
you know, pretty well everything about the science and the photography of, of snowflakes. But my, my new book, well, it does include the snowflake uh, element to it. Um, it is, uh, this is my, uh, my content proof copy uh, from the press. It talks all about the ultraviolet stuff. It talks all about the water droplet stuff and so on and so forth. Uh, all the rules of composition, all the craziness talking about diffraction, how you deal with freezing soap bubbles and everything else that you could possibly <laughs> imagine uh, in a nearly 400 page tome of knowledge cool <laughs> so, so obviously this fundraising thing has worked well for you it has uh now uh, to, to be fair you know kickstarter takes uh their own five percent and then the pro uh the, the payment processing fees is another five percent so there's ten percent gone right there uh and then you've got uh about a third of the total cost is shipping fees so that's just money that's held on to that to then you know send out again later uh in and out and uh the real uh biggest expense is the cost of production right the cost are of these print on demand or do you have a do, bunch printed um so th this is done with the highest quality materials it's going to have a spot gloss cover uh Friesen's press out of manitoba is producing it for me the print run will be five thousand copies uh, using the best materials and stuff that, that could be made. Um, and so it will far exceed any print on demand, mm -hmm. uh, type of quality. So you'll wind up with about a dollar three eighty. <laughs> yeah. Well, the thing is, um, I, I budget it such that I end up with no money at the end, except I end up with extra copies of the book that I could then sell. And that's where my profits come from. So, uh, I roll everything, uh, back into the production. Uh, so are you a not for profit? company no no i'm, I'm a for-profit my, my profit just comes from the extra so like if i pre-sold you know 1500 2000 copies but i'm ordering 5000 copies well then the extra 3000 copies is pure profit for me um so i mean if you want the inside baseball of how that works i put all the money into production uh to make as many as i can and then profit on the ones that were not pre-ordered that are sold after the date of the kickstarter campaign so is the skycrystals.ca link go to the Kickstarter? Uh, it goes to where you can pre-order the new book, yeah. The Kickstarter what? campaign oh. is, is long finished, but uh, uh, HTTPS. And why did you go from Indiegogo to Kickstarter? Because I run three Indiegogos for an institution before. That was uh, partly exposure. Um, partly, um, you know, the bigger projects uh, and the vetting process of Kickstarter is a little bit, uh, a little bit higher than Indiegogo, and and Indiegogo is more so than GoFundMe and so on and so forth. Uh, just putting the link in the chat there. Uh, oh, sorry, I sent that to, to Bob directly because he was the last one to message me. I will make that to everybody. Uh, but the the idea with um, Kickstarter was everybody is going to take a cut, right? So that's universal. Um, but Kickstarter might have been a bigger footprint in terms of uh, exposure from the platform if it was picked up on that. Uh, possibly slightly higher notoriety or, um, uh, I guess, legitimacy because they do vet things more seriously than other platforms. But if it wasn't Kickstarter, it was going to be Indiegogo again. I was really just flipping a coin at the end of it, just kind of doing a pros and cons uh, chart to figure that all out. I'm curious about, um, do you sleep? <laughs> uh, not as much as I would like. Um, do you relax? Uh, you know, I, I haven't relaxed much in the last little while. Especially uh, with the four-year-old, huh? Especially with the four-year-old, she keeps you on your toes. And <laughs> uh, But, but the, the thing about I mean, my, my passion time is when I get to pick up the camera and especially when I'm given that three hour block of time where nobody's going to bug me and I might not make anything useful. I might make mistakes that I revel in and find the solutions to later, you know, when, when I wake up the next morning and have a eureka moment. Um, uh, so, and that, that, so even when I'm sleeping there, Michael, I'm, I'm working, I'm working through those problems that I had during the day. When do you, when do you find that you do your best work? Is it late at night when everybody else is asleep or during the day when it's a it used to be it used to be when my wife was gone to work and my daughter was at daycare um then i would have like six hours uninterrupted at home when nobody else was here um now that hasn't existed in a year <laughs> so uh you know i to, to say that i have been less productive would be an apt description of of the past year uh, it took a lot longer to finish my book, for example, where there was some pages that would took me uh, like a week or two to, to finalize just because it was so complex and I didn't have the focus that I needed to get through that. 
Um, but uh, as things return to normal, I think that uh, that that normalcy of uh, of having people out of the house uh, would uh, would would be an advantage for my creative endeavors moving forward. Um, Anya says, "Is it ebook only or hardcover? Both are available on my website, so you'll see one available as a PDF and one available as a hardcover. There's even a leather-bound limited edition hardcover, um, uh, but uh, uh, you've got three options to choose from there." A question came in on Facebook: Did you show these crystals in a show in the Pioneer Square in Seattle two years ago? I have not been to Seattle ever, so okay. No. So if someone else is. No, no knock in Seattle. Yeah, uh, I just I haven't yeah. been there. <laughs> I wanted to chime in on publishing what you said a minute ago about it. I, I can say that in my own experience, at least, even with good advances from publishers, I still made more income from selling my own personal stash of the books. And so I, I built that that overrun. So I even in some cases paid for an overrun of the books beyond what the publisher wanted. So I had my own set of copies as well. Stephen, so, that's a great, uh, great thing to state. And now I am my own publisher. So it's yeah. self-published because I was able to raise the funds. I didn't have anybody paying me in advance right. other than those that pitched in on the Kickstarter campaign. So, right. uh, but from yeah, I've, that done, I've done both, but I've done both, but still, well, in the case where I owned it completely, I made some money. Up front. But, right. but, then, but then you the also people... run the risk. Okay. I might be sitting on 3000 copies of a very big, right. heavy book. That's difficult to right. ship and difficult to move. Um, so that that's the gamble that you play, but by uh, crowdfunding it, that gamble is paid for by the people that already put into it. And if I don't make any money because I don't sell any more books than that, well, that, <laughs> that's my risk mitigation. Yeah. And in some cases, I've left the, the uh, printed uh, book uh, unbound to save on money and then came back and then bound those later when there was clearly a market for them. That's so there's all sorts of strategies. Yeah. Yeah. Well, maybe that's a topic for another show is how to sell, how to put together books and the business side behind it all. <laughs> oh, well, the, the, the business side of it, uh, I mean, my, my first book, had, the entire press run had to be completely scrapped uh, and reprinted because of some mistakes that were not my fault. But uh, I had to threaten open letters to the public before anybody would wow. uh, would uh, sort of own up to uh, the problems that were there. So publishing has its own nightmares that will keep you up at night. Uh, <laughs> thankfully, it's getting better. Uh, but uh, be sure you do your homework, John. You're right. That that's a whole other discussion, a uh, whole other topic. So, uh, John, I got a question. Yeah. Where the hell did you get my background? I don't know. I had this for a while. It's just one of those pop-up <laughs> ones. <laughs> no, it's just that for one reason or another, on the the display, you and I are side by side, and it's oh. like, wait a second. <laughs> I like my lighting better, but uh, yeah. Least, uh, and I also got a kick out of your haircut. Yeah, if, if, I give myself says, a haircut once every six months or so. Yeah, this was my um, first one in over twenty years. Yeah, Don. So I was going to say is, uh, you sure have a lot of fun doing this shit, and that's part of the whole process. Uh, if if you're it's not, not having fun, fun, it's not worth doing. Exactly. But but uh, Jeff, to, I, I want to uh, to echo that a little bit further. Um, I don't have fun making the final image. I have fun making mistakes. And if you don't enjoy that part of the process, then you're never going to get past those mistakes. A lot of people will take an image and say, oh, that didn't work out. Let's move on to something else. Well, I would say, oh, well, that's cool. That didn't work. Uh, let, let's figure out why. Um, and, and that puzzle solving uh ethos, I guess, uh, is, is really important because if you don't uh, take that one moment of that mistake and say, okay, this is where my sense of progress is going to be right here solving, you know, one of five yeah. problems before this actually turns into something. And so at the end of the day, you've spent hours solving one problem and finding five more. Um, that was a good day, right? Yeah. Uh, well, that's the whole process of learning. Uh, you know, <laughs> If this shit was easy, why would you bother to do it? Um, making mistakes and finding uh, new results, unexpected results. That's one of the things that I love about, uh, well, so a lot of the stuff that you're doing is you may have some preconceived notions, but it's the discovery of unexpected um, or unanticipated results. Uh, the other thing I was gonna ask you, uh, Don, is who are you emailing when you're emailing about these issues? I'm very interested about the 
um, uh, noise reduction, not reducing noise. Uh, and I, I have a couple of emails that I know that I can send things to and get actual answers from. At the time, Jeff, I had an inside track to Tom Hogarty, uh, who was the, uh, the yeah. He's not an manager. engineer; he's a product manager. Right, but it, you don't you don't get a, uh, something to be fixed by an engineer. You get it being no, sent you from do a product actually, manager to an engineer. When it's uh, Lightroom or Camera Raw, you do get it fixed by an engineer, and that engineer's name is Thomas Noel. Right. But uh, yeah. my, my contact with Tom Hogarty, he's no longer with Adobe, or at least it, he left. And I don't, I don't know if he's come back, uh, but um, Hogarty? yeah, it was a few years ago. Was it a year no, ago? He, Tom's he's still, still there. there. Is he still there? Well, he, he <laughs> left the, the project lead for some of these things. Well, he's all... not, he wasn't involved in camera raw or Lightroom. Right. Um, but basically Thomas Noel is the product manager, the lead engineer and the everything about camera raw, the pipeline. But I haven't Eric gone Chan back to process five fellow, yet to see. But. Uh, yeah. Eric Chan would be the fellow that would be interested in solving that uh, noise problem. So, Well, then get me his email address and I'll complain to him. because <laughs> He can do <laughs> that. Yeah, Eric Chan is pretty accessible. Yeah. 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 He, um, always tries, he always tries to help. She can make that happen. <laughs> and anyway, on my wait, conversation. Wait, wait, Don. Yeah. Don, question. What's your Hustle, background? Yes. What's your, what, what did you do before you, you went? Abby I, I have a diploma on the wall from uh, my community college in advertising and that's it. Ah, okay. <laughs> um, but you know, it, it, it sounds like I might have a degree in something sciencey. No, it's just the, the pure love of figuring stuff out. And I failed calculus twice in high school because I could never find a reason to really use the area under a curve for any reason in my adult <laughs> life. Like it just, it didn't have practical applications. Yeah. And my so for, my for downfall me, in high school was chemistry where I knew more than the teacher and I just walked out of the class and. <laughs> <laughs> you know, well, there's that too, but so well, much of it was Donna, theoretical it, and pointless. And as soon as I found a practical application for science through photography, then it all gelled together. My downfall Donna, it sounds like was women. <laughs> Don, it sounds like it sounds like you and I are mirror images. I have a degree in in imaging science, and then spent thirty years in advertising. <laughs> there you go. Uh, but well, advertising is a lot of visual communication, and it's a lot of the art of persuasion, and and, and a lot of that applies to photography. I'm not yeah. saying that there's no overlap, um, but uh, I, I am saying that my formal education helped me be a small business owner and an entrepreneur uh, and all that, but it didn't really have anything or any impact on the passions of the things that I photograph. Don, I want to tell you something. I, I really enjoyed uh, listening to you, uh, trying to understand you, uh, <laughs> but the, the listening was terrific. The visuals, the imagery was wonderful. I, yeah, I, really is. I, uh, I in no way will ever be a. Um, um, you won't be Don. No, I, I won't. <laughs> I won't even come close to being a competitor <laughs> on that level. I mean, it's just, it's it's wonderful that you have this passion for doing something that is so intricate, so tiny, and, and, and to come up with images that are that beautiful. If you try to, to walk down the same path as, as me, one of the beautiful things is even if you try to replicate my process exactly verbatim, you would find your own way about it, right? Like th there's no way that somebody can replicate the body of work that I have produced, no matter how detailed of a description I describe, because the artistic element within That's there exactly right. will immediately yep. uh, be influenced by the photographer. Uh, and so I have no problem sharing every single secret technique piece of equipment that I might use in anything, partly because you're not going to recreate the same thing as I am. And if you try very hard, well, you might get close. And if you really, really try to put me to shame, well, that's fine because I'm already 10 steps ahead down the road. <laughs> <laughs> so I just wanted to mention that on Thursday, my guest is um, Calvin Greer on carbon printing. And the title he's given to his presentation is Excelling at Failure. <laughs> awesome. We should all do. We should all do more of that. <laughs> I just wanted to make 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 one other statement that uh, yeah. um, to let, I'll let everybody that, that's still on know that uh, Anthony Edgeworth passed away. Last yeah, I week. saw that. Sorry to hear that. Yeah, 
So, uh, oh, condolences there. You know, Don, Michael yeah. asked you about your background and you answered with your degree, but uh, which of course was, I, I understand why, but the background question still is of interest to me. There, there has to be all sorts of curiosities and explorations you, you, you did that led you down to this path that made this a seductive path for you. And that would be an interesting uh, uh, thing well, for me I'll, to know. I'll, I'll sum that up, uh, Stephen. You know, I, I was always curious as a child. You know, every kid goes, a, goes through a period where they just ask why. And then whatever the answer is, the response is always why again, repeatedly. And this annoys the heck out of parents. I know because I'm living that right now. Um, but, but my dad uh, would always try to find an answer and just keep going as long as I was willing to keep asking why. And uh, it really showed me that you know, there's always more questions to be asked about things. And there was a sense of curiosity within So that. how close did you come to getting electrocuted as a kid? Uh, we nearly killed the cat on a number of occasions with high voltage electricity. So, uh, the, yeah, that that's happened. Yeah. But uh, yeah, we we tried to build a, a Jacob's ladder, you know, the electrical bolt that's kind of going up to mm -hmm. prongs and what have you. But we didn't have uh, a flyback transformer. We had to use microwave transformers, and that's not good. Um, that's not ideal. Uh, you know, a flyback transformer might knock you through a wall, but you'll get up and dust yourself off. A microwave transformer will melt you in place. Um, so, uh, yeah, that's we nearly don't do this that, but, at home. In other words, <laughs> exactly. Uh, but so I, I had some uh, science instilled from my father at a young age. But my, my dad, um, he had his his issues that ended to an early death for him. He died at the age of forty seven. Uh, due to uh, end-stage liver disease from a life of alcohol and drug abuse. Nice. And, um, but he was an inspiration to me uh, as a child. And when he was getting quite sick, uh, and I was trying to visit him while going to college and working and juggling all these things. He gave Are you me an, an only envelope. child? Uh, I'm an only child, Michael, yeah. Uh, and so he gave me an envelope uh, that had some money in it, uh, sort of like a living will. He wanted to see me enjoy something uh, while he still could. And I, at that point, I had no interest in photography, zero. But I knew that he had a love of photography through his entire uh, childhood. He wanted to be a photojournalist. And his parents, uh, my, my grandparents, did the smart thing and said, no, um, you can't you know, raise a family on that kind of uh, unstable career and, and income. So he never got to pursue that. But I wanted to reconnect with him. So with having no interest in photography, I, I went out and I bought a camera, uh, a Rebel XTI at the time. And... Uh, and so he was thrilled with that. Uh, he didn't expect it. He thought I'd buy like a video game system or something. And uh, so we started bonding over photography. He started teaching me uh, some of the technical stuff, some of the psychological stuff. I started teaching him about the digital world and, uh, and all of this. And so we started sharing notes. And, um, and uh, when, when his time came, uh, there was a small amount of life insurance money that I used to pay off my student debts, uh, buy a slightly better camera. Uh, and thought, you know what, I might be able to, like, there's a spark here. I might be able to pursue this professionally. And then I started working at an advertising agency out of school uh, while also working part-time at a camera store uh, and taking all of my money because I was still living with my mom at the time. I had a one-year window, a one-year opportunity where uh, my wife and I, my, my then girlfriend and uh, subsequently fiance, uh, I had a, uh, a one-year window where she was still finishing school and I was still living at home. If I could make it work, if I could put in 100 hour weeks and, uh, and arrive at a job that could make me similar to minimum wage, uh, just from that amount of effort so that we could support ourselves, then, then I could pursue it. And I just barely made it after that year, uh, after some successful art shows and so on uh, that, uh, that showed me that photography could be a career. And there was a lot of back of of you. Uh, what's that, Michael? Is your wife supportive of the uh, the work that you do? Oh, yes, absolutely. Uh, at now she is. Uh, at first, uh, it's not that she wasn't supportive, but she was cautiously supportive because you had to put the numbers on paper. Where right. are you going to make money throughout the year and how is that going to pay the bills? And if you can get it to all balance out uh, with very conservative numbers, then yes, we, we, can, we can work. But does this. she work uh, with you in your business? Nope. 
not really. No, I mean, she's a, a beautiful abstract oil painter herself. And, oh, and so okay. she, uh, she's a wonderful artist. She's a registered nurse. And so she right now uh, works uh, three to four days a week in long-term care facilities. And she's a trooper. She's one of the frontline people out there in the world. And I have the utmost respect for her and what she's doing. But right now, um, and, uh, and I guess for the, uh, the, the, the bulk of time that we've had in, in the past few years, it's me being a one-man show. Uh, and, uh, and that's worked so far. She does help because through this entire conversation, she's been wrangling my four and a half year old daughter upstairs <laughs> to not come into this, this room and disrupt me. So she is doing her fair share, I can guarantee you, just not on the books. But if someone's answering machine is kind of coming in now. <laughs> there it goes. Well, that's a great story about your dad and the gift of imagination and questioning and encouragement at the same time, ending up giving you the uh, gift of checking out photography and then having that exchange. I, I wish that he could see me uh, sort of living yeah. his dream right now. Uh, maybe in some way he is, but, uh, uh, but I just continue down this path and it just keeps getting more and more interesting. Yeah. My I dad when I, died when I was 19 and missed all this. So, you, you know, yeah. you know what it's like. I appreciate you sharing this story. Oh, my pleasure. Darn, well, you've you done all. well. You've really done very, very well. I, um, I applaud you for um, what you've done and how well you present yourself honestly. Much appreciated. Thank you. Well, thank you all for joining. It's been a lot of fun. Um, Don, did you leave your contact information? Uh, yeah, well, I, I put the, the little link where you can get the book. Uh, okay. I can also put um, uh, where, where people can check out my, my website in general, uh, www.doncom.ca. I'm just going to put that in the chat here uh, as well. And uh, uh, and just to, 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 to uh, wind things off, um, uh, John asked, even if I borrowed your fossilized snowflake to do exactly the same thing. Well, you can make <laughs> your own, John. All you need is a 1% solution of polyvinyl acetal resin and ethylene dichloride. Um, and you too <laughs> can make your own preserved snowflakes. Um, so you don't you don't have to borrow mine. Uh, or you can that. drink it. You can drink it too. <laughs> uh, yeah, probably not hair. great. Uh, <laughs> it comes in hazardous materials packaging because it causes cancer. So don't think you want to be drinking yeah. that stuff. Uh, oh, but uh, you can substitute that scientific resin used in uh, electron microscopy for super glue. The active ingredient in most super glue is cyanoacrylate, which doesn't freeze until about minus 20 degrees Celsius. And you can leave that outside with a plate of glass and you can preserve your own snowflakes with super glue pretty darn easily. So do you have a way to make artificial snowflakes? Uh, yes, I have not been <laughs> successful in the endeavor oh, okay. yet, uh, but all it involves is an aquarium air pump and a chest freezer. Very cool. So <laughs> I think we'll just gonna, leave it there. I'm we'll gonna leave have, it there. I'm gonna go take some electroshock therapy after this. <laughs> I gotta tell you. Very cool. Well, I think thank Don you still all has so some much. leftover transformers. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Stick my head in a microwave. Thank you, Don. <laughs> You're welcome, everybody. Thanks, Don. Thanks, Thanks, Sean. Thanks, Sean. All the best. You're Happy welcome. Thank you Stay so creative. Much. Stay sane with, out there. Good luck with the new book. Thanks. Appreciate it. Yeah, Take care. Mueller?